You may be seated. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, amen. As you know, Pastor Rich and his son Andy are on a pilgrimage. They're hiking the Camino de Santiago de Compostela. Camino is the Spanish word for road. Santiago is the Spanish name for St. James the Greater. And Compostela is a town in the Spanish province of Galicia in northwestern Spain. The Camino is a pilgrimage route shown in bold red uh, on this map, which runs westward from Pamplona in northeastern Spain to Campostela in the northwest. But the route is fed by an extensive network of roads throughout Europe. The destination is the gravesite of St. James. Now, there's a story behind all this, and it begins with this morning's text, Matthew 4, 18 through 22. <clears throat> and before I read it, I want to make sure, our, oh, the, there we go, there's the video, thank you, sorry. <clears throat> Matthew 4, 18 through 22. As Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father, Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. <clears throat> we learn here that James, son of Zebedee, was one of Jesus' first four disciples. Sometime after Jesus' resurrection, James traveled to Spain to preach the gospel. But in the year 44 AD, he returned to Jerusalem where he was arrested by Herod Agrippa and executed. James thus became one of the earliest Christian martyrs. His earthly remains were returned to Spain for burial, and eventually he was named the patron saint of that country. During the Middle Ages, Christians from all over Europe began making pilgrimages to James's grave. Eventually, his bones were placed in a golden reliquary and are now displayed behind strong iron bars uh, in the Compostela Cathedral. This is the last stop and the high point of the Camino. Now, a pilgrimage whether to Compostela in Spain, or Canterbury in England, or Jerusalem in the Holy Land, or any other holy place, is said to have great spiritual benefit to the pilgrim. Why? Because the pilgrimage symbolizes the Christian life, and the destination is where you encounter the holy. The earliest Christian term for the Christian faith itself was the hodos, the way, the road, or in Spanish, the camino. Pilgrims must trust in the providence of God because many aspects of their journey are beyond their control. Will the weather be cold and rainy or hot and muggy? Will I find food and water and shelter along the way? Will my fellow pilgrims be friendly or all too friendly? <clears throat> Will I suffer blisters or bed bugs or heat stroke? 
Can I shoulder the weight of my backpack over the long miles? How will I relieve the boredom? Such worrisome questions have obvious parallels in ordinary life. But the pilgrimage is the, the, the pilgrimage raises these questions with great immediacy and urgency. And you learn on pilgrimage, as you are supposed to learn in the long haul of the Christian life, to depend on God to see you through whatever the answers to these worrisome questions might be. Some months ago, it occurred to me that it might be meaningful for us as a congregation and for Pastor Rich himself if we journeyed with him in spirit by studying some of the great journey stories from the Bible. Let me give you a quick outline of this five-week series. Today, we will look at the journey of Abraham, or Abram as he was originally known, from Ur of the Chaldeans to a new home that God had promised him in the land of Canaan. Next week, we will study Moses' great confrontation with the Pharaoh of Egypt and the subsequent exodus of the Hebrew slaves through the, uh, through the Red Sea into the wilderness of Sinai. On September 18, we will look at the story of the prophet Jonah, who was sent by God on a mission to Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire, but fled in fear in the opposite direction until he got turned around again thanks to some worried sailors and an obliging whale. <clears throat> on September 25th, we will follow St. Paul on his secondary, second missionary journey, focusing on the decisive moment in that journey when, uncertain of his next move, he saw a vision of a Macedonian man inviting him to carry the gospel from Asia into Europe. Finally, on October 2nd, we will hike with Jesus from the Sea of Galilee to an ancient pagan sanctuary near the town of Caesarea Philippi and learn why it was there, of all places, that he first told his disciples who he was and what he had come to do and how they were supposed to follow him. These sermons will sound a lot like lectures. Short lectures. Not more than a couple hours. <clears throat> I'll be giving you a lot of background information about the stories and characters and showing you various maps and pictures. But I also want them to be spiritually formative for you, not just academically informative. So I'll be emphasizing what I think each story tells us about our own pilgrimage of faith. From Abraham, we will learn what it means to trust God's provision for the journey. From Moses, we will learn about displaying courage in the face of obstacles and opposition. From Jonah, we will learn why mercy to one's enemies is so necessary. From Paul, we will learn what it means to live in hope when we don't know our way. And from Jesus, we will learn about the cost to ourselves of following the pilgrim road. So that's our plan. We begin our five-week journey with the story of the call of Abram as found in Genesis 11, 27 through 12, 9. Now, these are the descendants of Terah. Terah was the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran was the father of Lot. Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his birth, in Ur of the Chaldeans. Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Now, Sarai was barren. She had no child. Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans, to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. 
The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. The one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai and his brother's son Lot and all the possessions that they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran, and they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem to the oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar, the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on by stages toward the Negev. When did these events occur? Historians, archaeologists, and linguists have sifted a great deal of evidence. And the best guess, but it's only a guess with a wide margin of error, is around 1960 BCE. That is almost as many years before the birth of Christ as we are now living after it. It was the Middle Bronze Age when people were smelting copper and tin from their respective ores and combining them into that hard, durable alloy known as bronze. The use of iron still lay 800 years in the future. And where did these events occur? Abram's journey began in the city of Ur, a coastal city on the Persian Gulf and one of the largest cities of the Neo-Sumerian Sumerian Empire. You can see it there, I hope, down toward the bottom right of the green, in the green patch. The Neo-Sumerian Empire dominated Mesopotamia, which is basically modern Iraq, from the 22nd through the 21st centuries B.C. At its height, it controlled, controlled all the green areas on this map, and its sphere of influence extended into Syria, as shown in the light green areas on the upper left. But around the year 2000 B.C., the Sumerians were invaded from the east by the Elamites, and they lived down in the lower right-hand corner corner of that map, and they were steadily infiltrated, though not necessarily always viol violently invaded, but from the northwest by a group of peoples known as the Amorites, a very diverse group of people who spoke various West Semitic languages, one of which was an early form of Hebrew. Scripture calls Abram a Hebrew. So he may have been an Amorite. At any rate, he and his family left Ur, where they had settled perhaps a generation or two earlier, then traveled 600 miles northwest up the Euphrates River to a town called Haran in Syria, which would be located again in that light green area there on that map. Were they traveling to escape all the political turmoil in Mesopotamia, which archaeology has revealed? 
Or were they called by God, as the Bible says? Maybe both. Abram and Sarai stayed in Haran in Syria for some years until they reached their 70s. And they seemed to have prospered there. So why leave? Well, because God's plan was to get them to the land of Canaan on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea, about 450 miles southwest of Haran, as shown on this map. For it was during their stay in Haran that God called them onward. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This call turns out to be the cornerstone of biblical faith. Three points stand out. First, God speaks directly and personally to Abram. In the context of ancient religion, especially ancient Mesopotamian religion, this is astonishing. The gods of ancient Mesopotamia, and there were dozens, perhaps hundreds of them, were identified either with natural phenomena, such as the sky, the earth, the oceans, the rivers, or with political units, such as city-states and regional empires. The gods' business was to assure the fertility of the land and the good order of human society. But the Mesopotamian gods were capricious and often violent beings, as our natural phenomena and as our political units, as we are discovering. And the worship that human beings offered them was meant to curry their favor or calm their rage. What's more, only kings and priests could safely approach them, and then only on special occasions, such as the great New Year's festival. Ordinary people, like shepherds and shopkeepers, farmers and craftsmen, had no direct access to their gods. They were supposed to do their jobs, they the people, pay their taxes, obey the laws, attend the public festivals, and otherwise shut up. In contrast to the gods of Mesopotamia, the God of Israel, and there was, of course, only one of him, speaks directly and graciously to the nobodies of society no less than to kings and priests. And when God speaks, God makes covenant. Not just a time-limited quid pro quo business contract, you do this, I'll do that, but an intimate, permanent, personal relationship. Second, God's covenant with Abram involves promise-making and promise-keeping. And God makes promises on God's part and expects promises on God's people's part. In this particular text, there are three of these promises, and they too are astonishing. Promise one, Abram will take possession of the land of Canaan, a strip of Mediterranean coastline about 400 miles long, and 100 miles wide, a place that he's never seen, and which has occupants. Promise two, Abram will become the father of a great nation, that is, a people with whom God's covenant, begun with Abram, will last forever. Promise three, this nation will have a special mission to all the other families of the earth, not a special status above them, but a special responsibility to them. Israel will be a blessing for them. For through Israel, they will come to know Israel's God. The Old Testament is the story of how God fulfilled these three promises in the miraculous ups of Israelite history, 
and remained faithful to these promises through the catastrophic downs in Israel's history. The third point that stands out in this text um, is that these three promises that he that God has made require Abram to respond. Abram must get up and go to the promised land, and he must trust that God will show him the way and provide for him along the way and provide for him when he gets there. And Abram's twofold response to God's promises is not a one-off, a simple matter of getting his family from one place on the map to another. No. It sets the agenda for the entire biblical story. The descendants of Abram and Sarah will forever be a people on the go. Nor will their journey be merely geographical. It will also be historical. It will be a pilgrimage through space, throughout the world, and through time, across the centuries. God's people will constantly be on the go when they are dwelling safe and secure in their promised hand, land and when they are toiling as slaves in Egypt or languishing as exiles in Babylon or being murdered by the millions in the Nazi death camps. At all times and in all places, God's people will be a pilgrim who must trust God to guide their steps and provide for their needs. What's more, their pilgrimage operates at both the national level for Israel as a people traveling together generation by generation across 4,000 years of history and at the personal level for each of us, one by one, family by family, living our individual lives in companionship with God. It's a very all-embracing story. Now, all pilgrimages are journeys, but not all journeys are pilgrimages. A pilgrimage is a journey plus. It's not just aimless wandering, or a weekend getaway, or a fun-filled family vacation. A pilgrimage is an arduous trek which takes you someplace that you know, deep in your heart, you have to reach in order to become the person you are meant to be. Let me say that again. Pilgrimage is an arduous trek which takes you somewhere that you know deep in your heart you have to reach to become the person you are meant to be. A pilgrimage is a journey with a destination and a pilgrim is a person with a destiny. That's why, for example, pilgrimages to holy places have always been such a means of grace for Christian people. They are physical symbols of the kind of lifelong journey that we are called to make of our lives. The pilgrimage has a definite geographical end point, Campostella or Canterbury or Jerusalem, just as human life has a definite temporal end point, death and whatever comes beyond. And we pilgrims who walk the weary way of human life have a definite spiritual goal, eternal fellowship with God. One of my favorite artists, Albrecht Dürer, has powerfully captured this in his painting, Night, Death, and the devil, the knight marches bravely forward, undeterred by the very real and immediate dangers all around him. Being on pilgrimage requires trust in God. In fact, the one absolutely necessary thing a pilgrim needs is faith that God will get her there. And the more you think about it, the stranger that seems, 
Yet the more you think about it, the closer you come to the very heart of biblical faith. Our natural tendency when going on a journey is to make careful preparations and take wise precautions. We study maps and travel brochures. We make reservations in advance. We buy the right gear. We do everything possible to assure our safety and security and comfort. And all this makes good sense. And Abram did the, the equivalent. For as our text says, Abram took his wife Sarai and his brother's son Lot and all the possessions that they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran, and they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. There's no reason a faithful pilgrim shouldn't be a savvy traveler. But a question arises. Do all these measures spring from the illusion that we can anticipate every eventuality and control every situation? And at an even deeper level, do they all spring from the worry that we have to control every situation and anticipate every eventuality because God won't help us along the way? For Abram, the answer was clear. And for us, it should be. Abram had street smarts, and he trusted God's provision. Indeed, he trusted God's provision precisely because he understood the limits of his street smarts. This attitude of trust makes all the difference, both in walking the road and in reaching the destination. It strengthens us when things are in chaos, and it alerts us to life's unexpected and undeserved blessings when they arise. Don't leave home without it. Let me close with a story. Frederick the Great, the king of Prussia from 1740 to 1772, once asked his courtiers for proof of the existence of God. This was the sort of thing you did in the German Enlightenment in the 18th century. Prove the existence of God. While all these poor courtiers are racking their brains, I don't know how do we prove it? Finally, the, the, the court physician raised his hand. Your Majesty, the Jews. It's an excellent answer. For the continued existence of the Jews for over 40 centuries, despite the terrible hardships they have suffered along the way, can only be explained by their unwavering trust in a God who has rescued them wherever they could not protect themselves. So it is with Christians. People ask us, how can you possibly believe in God given all the evil and suffering in the world? To which we reply, how could we possibly endure all the evil and suffering in the world if we didn't believe in God? Our trust in God is not a preventative measure against life's difficulties. It's a source of power for facing life's difficulties. It's not a lucky rabbit's foot. It's a strong bulwark. And a healing balm. It's not a trick for making our journey easy. It's our way of bringing our difficult pilgrimage to a joyful conclusion. Amen.